For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is, what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Thanks, Phil. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. We pray that we would hear from you this morning. Soften our hearts that we would know your love for us and that we would be transformed by your love, we pray. For we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Over the month of September, here in All Saints, we're thinking about the church, which might be sort of obvious considering we meet every Sunday, but we don't necessarily always think, actually, what is the church? Why do we meet? Last week, we looked at the great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And we thought about the church like that, that the church is receiving of the love of God, Firstly, reflecting it back to God. Love the Lord your God with all your soul, mind, and strength. We do that in worship. And love your neighbor as yourself. Love those around you. Love those more in need. And we define the church like that. Now, this week we have a passage from 1 Corinthians. And I want to ask the question, is the message of the church worth sharing? It's an interesting point that the church never claims that the message in the Bible is the cleverest one out there. Though I might want to argue that it's potentially the most compelling and the most transformational. If you or I were to come up with a religion now, what would it look like? Would we have a strong God who maybe occasionally would interact with our world, maybe big miracles, maybe big showy things to prove that we were there. Or maybe we'd think, oh, why weren't they there? And we'd have a reason why they weren't. Maybe they were busy, not interested, maybe far away. Do we have any fans of the Marvel films out there? Anyone who's watched the latest film, Infinity War, That's essentially what the character Thor is. I don't know if you've ever thought of him like this. In the film there, he is the son of a god. He is a god himself. He occasionally comes down to earth. He has great power, though that power only comes at the help of his hammer. In the latest film, there's a great scene in it. I won't give away the plot line, but... A battle is going on, the raging of good and evil, the classic Marvel storyline, and evil is winning out. There's a great YouTube video of um, an American cinema, and they're all, you can actually hear them making kind of nervous noises, but then Thor's hammer fires through, 
and knocks out all the baddies. And they audibly shout for joy. And it's one of the most uplifting moments of all time. I, I couldn't be in a cinema with them actually watching it, but it was a, a brilliant moment. Thor, in that moment, changes the course of that scene and the course of that particular battle. He, through the power of his hammer, he uses the power of good to thwart the power of evil. Now, he's a great character, don't get me wrong, but he could not be further from the truth, from the person of Jesus. Listen to this, that God sent his son as a little baby. He started his life just as, as helpless as you or I And actually, when Jesus did do miracles, what did he say? He said, I only do what I see the Father doing. Jesus shows complete unity with his Father who is in heaven. And he would later die on a cross in a way that seemed like utter humiliation, but in a way that was completely for us, a way that would create access for us to meet with God. If I came up with a plan, if I'm honest, this wouldn't have been at the top of my list. But this is why God is God and we're not. So our passage actually talks about God's weakness. And this is Jesus in human frailty. This is Jesus coming to earth. This is Jesus being just like each one of us. Jesus dying on a cross. But this weakness far surpasses any form of human strength, any form of human cleverness or argument. Jesus caused scandal in his time because he forgave sins. And the people around him said, only God can do that. And they were absolutely right. Only God can forgive us from all the things that get in the way. Sins are often thought of as a a difficult world to understand, but think of it this way. Think of all the things that get in the way of your relationship with those around you. Those things that get in the way of your relationship with God. If we let them, they can really stick to us. They can really get in the way. But Jesus said that he can forgive those. He can take all of those away. Human wisdom, human argument can never give you that. That access to God, that freedom from everything that binds you back. So how is Jesus' claim not just another clever argument? If Jesus had died on the cross and we'd never heard anything about him again, he would have been just like us. But he didn't. Three days later, he was walking around again with his friends. The proof that he died was undoubtable. And the proof that he was raised from the dead, again, we have in multiple different sources, in Christian sources, in non-Christian sources. Last year, I finished a degree in Cambridge University, and there wouldn't be a single theologian or single historian who would claim that Jesus hadn't physically died or physically raised. They may or may not have faith themselves, but those two things were never in doubt for a single academic out there. These were just facts for them, things that were quite difficult, but the fact that he died, the fact that he was really dead, and the fact that he raised to life are shown in so many different sources that no one would ever try and say that it wasn't true. So the church doesn't try and have a clever argument. Why? In my opinion, it's because it doesn't need one. God's weakness, God's dying on a cross, will always be stronger than human strength. And our passage said that God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak 
chose Jesus dying on a cross in the world to shame what is strong. And we can trust in our own strength, but ultimately our own strength is, is going to fail us at one point or another. So putting our trust in God gives us infinitely more. And we'll be free from all that ties us down and all that would want to condemn us. At the beginning, I asked, what is it that the church shares, and is it worth sharing? And here it is. That God in humility that walked upon the earth, walked the same life that we did, offers us a way to meet with God, to be free from all those things that tie us down. And no Marvel screenwriter would ever write that script but it is greater than any Marvel film that they will ever be able to write. The church is the living embodiment of that truth. It is the freedom that God shows. And people who trust in God's weakness will find their strength there. Amen. Shall we pray just for a moment? Putting our trust in God's strength. Lord God, thank you that you sent Jesus to this world. Thank you that he lived a life just like us. And we say sorry that at times we have followed our own path, that we have wanted to use our own clever arguments. Help us today to see that the foolishness of the cross is our strength that it frees us from everything that would ever tie us down. If there's anything in this moment that you want to give to God, anything that has been bugging you or tying you down in this moment, I'm just going to leave a moment for you to just do business with God. Hand it over to him. Thank you that in you there is freedom. And I pray that this morning each one of us would live out that freedom, that joy, that love. And that we would know you now and for the rest of our days we pray. For we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.